there's this question that I call the intractability question, mm. which is, you know, we maybe we need to come to grips with looking at the difficulty of, of super intelligent AI alignment on like a 20 year time frame and be like, you know what, this may be an intractable problem. I feel like this really gets discussed. It's very possible that uh, super, tel- like, super intelligent AI alignment is intractable. I think if that ends up being true, then I would still feel more confident in an ecosystem where there isn't one agent uh, dominating everything, but there is some collection of uh, different agents that are kind of aligned based on hopefully various different methodologies centered around various different groups of people like that still feels uh like safer uh to me even if it ends up being the case that all of these super intelligences are acting on time scales where like we as humans are just like watching things whizzing past us and we can't contribute so my threat model here, which is, you know, Eliezer's and Miri's, is the, if anyone builds it, everyone dies, right? right. Like we're, we're like playing shuffleboard. We're getting closer and closer to the edge where we get zero points. And all I can think to do is like, just not get closer to the edge. I don't think we have a plan for the edge at all. Like, I feel like what you just described is you're trying to describe a plan for the edge. And I'm like, I think we just back away from the edge. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I would argue that, uh, like... The way I think about this is that, like, if you had to criticize, um, you know, like any of the plan for the edge ideas, whether it's mine or whether it's the EX or whether it's anyone's, is that they're kind of like technologically naive. But I would argue that the back away from the edge approach is uh, kind of politically naive in the sense that, uh, like, we're basically talking about an end party prisoner's dilemma and, uh, like, very deep levels of political cooperation. In in, a, in in the context of a reality where the the dominant theme of uh, 2025 seems to be that like more and more crazy dictators have discovered that you can just bomb people and then I mean they're starting to just bomb people right. It sounds like we both agree that the nature of the problem is that we're stuck between a rock and a hard place, right? And the only difference is that you're saying like, well, obviously we can't go to the rock. And I'm like, well, obviously we can't go to the hard place, right? Like we, both, we both just see something as impossible, but it's like, well, we just have to talk about which one's less impossible. Right. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. Right. And I think, uh, you know, th- there is a value in uh, kind of trying to do the right kind of bo- the, the right kind of both. Um, I think uh, like the thing that I think we should try to avoid is doing the wrong kind of both. Right. So getting back to the intractability thing, though. Right. So from my perspective, if we were a sane civilization, we would have a way to step back and evaluate how tractable or intractable the problem seems. This first occurred to me in 2023 when I was just on Twitter and I saw Jan Lakey, who was leading safety at OpenAI at the time before he kind of resigned in disgust <laughs> like a year later, but he was leading safety at OpenAI. And I remember he tweeted something that was just like optimistic and positive, like, oh, we're making some good progress on the safety team. You know, I'm optimistic. You know, it's a hard problem, but we'll, we'll eventually solve it. And my reaction to that was like, well, wait a minute, whose job is it? to point out that the problem is intractable. If it was intractable, right? I'm not even saying it is, but if it was, whose job would it be to point out, hey, this is an intractable problem? Because it seems like the guy who's in that seat is just assuming that he needs to plow forward and do his best. He's not stepping back and and meta-evaluating whether to sound the alarm. Yeah, and like also they don't have incentives to, right? Like, um, you know, these are corporations uh, where uh, the basically the in some ways the entire investment pitch is uh, like involves um, you know the probability that uh, these companies will uh, dominate a big part of the world economy as a result of uh, the uh, AGI and ASI boom, right? And, um, you know, in eras past, um, you know, you would have a strong publicly funded academia that has, uh, I mean, also unaligned incentives, but at least a different vector of uh, unaligned incentives. And uh, ideally, it would be uh, independent from, um, you know, both uh, the tech world and the military world. And uh, it would be able to say and make these arguments. But uh, like right now, that's not super strong. Um, and then also OpenAI, of course, um, you know, at the beginning had this uh, idealistic vision that uh, it would have this nonprofit governance and then it would have this uh, like very strong uh, alignment team internally. But then, um, you know, as we saw, like it, basically the company ended up uh, giving up openness for safety and then uh, giving up safety for winning the race. Yeah, yeah. Spe- speaking of open AI, I, want- I wanted to ask you about this situation you know, on-, on the topic of policy and on the topic of whose job is it to say that it's intractable. So I remember during the open AI board coup, Helen Toner observed, there was that famous drama where she observed, 
ensuring AGI benefits humanity, you know, OpenAI's charter, that might be consistent with OpenAI collapsing rather than keeping Sam as CEO, right? So she was kind of in that seat of being like, hey, uh, th this isn't going to work out. We shouldn't just go do our best. We should potentially, you know, shut it down. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, it's uh, a common pattern, right? That's uh, like, I, I, I forget uh, like where this was from, but the standard joke is like, I want to save the world and I want to be the one doing it, right? Like, uh, Right. People and organizations and entities of all kinds, whether for profit or non profit or government or charity or whatever, they yeah, often are very averse to the yeah, idea that uh, the best way to accomplish uh, their mission or goal might just be to stop working on, uh, on, on what they're working on and dissolve. I want to ask you about uh, Anthropic and Dario Amade. Anthropic, there's obviously a lot to like. I mean, the team is obviously rock stars, lots of great people. And I know that they're conflicted. Uh, I know that like when I personally, with a, a handful of people from Pause AI, when we protested outside their office, I know that they felt pangs of guilt. <laughs> Anthropic AI. Reckless. Dario Amde. Reckless. Reckless. Like they took the protest seriously, um, and like they're good people, so I, I can I can empathize with where they're coming from. Even though my position is that they should just quit, you know, Anthropic on, in one sense is like the best actor among the AI companies because they truly feel that safety is important, and P Doom is like I don't know more than in the sane zone, more than ten percent. Now, having said all those good things about Anthropic, there's also an argument that they're actually doing the most damage because, from my perspective, they are tractability washing the problem like remember i'm saying like it's so important to say this might be intractable but when anthropic is saying yeah there's like you know there's a big chance of catastrophe but we're just going to do our best it's like no wait wait stand back don't don't do your best yet first evaluate if it's tractable and i feel like anthropic is the the one that's most guilty of tractability washing yeah, I think uh, very plausible. Like from an uh, institution design perspective, I think uh, like if you gave me an uh, AI company whose goal is to both advance progress and ensure safety, um, then uh, like one of the first things that would pop into my head is basically that, hey, maybe, yeah, we want to really yeah, ensure the yeah, independence of the yeah, safety side, so it doesn't uh, like feel the need to be yeah uh, to like have opinions that are compliant with what the progress side wants. And then if you take that logic to its end conclusion, then uh, basically what you get is that the company should just take like a third or a half of its uh, treasury and just like plump it into a a totally yeah independent uh, I mean like nonprofit whose uh, job is to like critique both uh, the yeah remaining progress division of that company and all the other companies from the yeah, from the outside right and like this is clearly not the sort of thing that they're doing right and this is the sort of thing that they're all moving away from i mean as robin hansen keeps saying like human beings are great at uh, rationalization i uh, yeah i mean but, but and then on the other hand like being brave in the context of an organization and just saying like let's uh, like we we want to do this radical thing that a bunch of people will think is crazy like that's hard but i uh, hope that um, you know, like people in these uh, companies do get the the courage and uh, and then try to actually do something like that yeah they tried to do that at openai with the 20 percent of the resources Right, but that's a team inside of a company, right? And then, uh, right, right, I mean, right, of right. course, I mean, you know, theoretically, there's a nonprofit and has a mission, but then, like, we just saw how, uh, like, unfortunately, yeah, as much as I really, yeah, like, respect the governance experiment of, like, making hybrid structures that are, like, both profit-making and that have, like, some kind of social mission that actually has teeth, like, I think that particular experiment's definitely, yeah, got worn down over time, and I think, uh, you know, it lasted a decade, and at the this point i just uh model it as a profit making entity and i think uh the main social value of like basically the all of the non-profit parts of the governance uh, seems to be that it uh, it puts uh uncertainty into the yeah company uh, into the corporate structure that uh, scares away investors that reduces the amount of capital that they, they have access to and that's like a very important contribution to ai safety in itself right but uh mm -hmm. you know even still it's limited so from my perspective, you know, we're kind of locked into this dynamic that's kind of like a race to the bottom, as you say, you know, they're just capitalist actors. But I want to ask you about Dario Amade's race to the top, right? Because he's basically saying, hey, 
we're going to do a race to the top. We are going to uh, make a company that people want to join. This is Dario's words. A company that people want to join that engages in practices that people think are reasonable while managing to maintain its position in the ecosystem. If you can do that, people will copy it. What are your thoughts? This feels like the sort of thing that uh, can work well in some eras, but that uh, breaks down in, uh, more, in more chaotic eras. And I think, um, you know, we are going to be in a more chaotic era for uh, the next couple of uh, decades. Um, so I think it's, uh, I mean, it's very admirable that he has that sentiment. Um, I think it's uh, great that Anthropic is doing that as opposed to doing what uh, OpenAI is doing or what most of the other companies are uh, doing. But uh, like, is that alone going to be yeah, sufficient? Uh, I mean, I don't think so, just because I think like the human capability for rationalization is crazy powerful. Human beings are like very strongly influenced by yeah, like social factors and incentives and uh, like motivations that correlate with uh, the thing you're in becoming bigger in both monetary and non-monetary ways. And so like it's true for nonprofit things too. And if you want to be yeah, sustainable, like you have to come up with a way to actually give yourself incentives that are aligned with uh, yourself doing the right thing. And like, I haven't seen OpenAI doing that yet. I think, I mean, if they do do that, then like that would be amazing and that would make me much happier. So when I heard Dario's race to the top, I was just asking myself, like, what is, what is the game theory of race to the top? Because I thought it was race to the bottom. Can you really just flip it? And my conclusion is just that it's it's like what he's saying does have a kernel of truth. Like when Anthropic comes out with like, hey, let's have responsible scaling policies or like, you know, just ideas they have or like, let's let's do some research and, you know, poke at our AIs and do mechanistic interpretability. Like all of that stuff can be part of the game theory equilibrium if it's like free or cheap, right? So right, so exactly. essentially like, like Pareto improvements, right? That's basically what he's pitching. Yeah, like the way that I would kind of steal man the case is basically that like top talent wants to be part of making the world better and not making the world worse. And uh, like what like actual top talent is often very willing to take large salary cuts in order to be part of uh, that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. uh, so if they do that, then uh, like that can actually attract top talent. And like I actually think Ethereum itself, like its uh, success has been uh, to a large part because of that, right? Like Ethereum is, uh, you know, like the thing in the crypto space that really yeah, tries hard to stick to the ideals, to be yeah, decentralized, uh, to value open source, uh, to value security, to value uh, things like censorship resistance, uh, when there is a lot of blockchains that try to cut corners for the sake of uh, like speed and enterprise deployment and consumer use cases. And uh, like it does ha somehow happen uh, that, uh, you know, despite um, Ethereum being one of the more ideological of the bunch, it just keeps succeeding. And uh, like, I think uh, like that effect uh, is probably a big part of the reason why. But the question is like, are you operating in a regime where that kind of pressure is decisive or are you not? And I think like blockchains are very coordination dependent and so that can work. Um, I think AI is much more, uh, is less like a community and more like a tool. And so that kind of pressure is, is uh, probably somewhat lower. And um, so, I mean, but like less optimistic there, but also, yeah, like it's uh, I'm, I'm definitely very glad that the uh, Anthropic people are thinking in that direction. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Um, I, I, I forgot about that, what you're saying about like, well, look, if you want to attract the best talent and the talent has these opinions, then you're, you know, you're, you're getting a win. So it's, you, you can get paid essentially and, and better talent when you, when you're racing to the top. So yeah, I mean, I, I got to give Dario credit for having a kernel of truth to what he's saying. And the question is just like, how much does it fight the race to the bottom? I would argue not much, but anyway, okay. So last topic for you, um, we, you know, we've, we've gone object level. I think we're, you it was very interesting to contrast our views. I don't see a huge gap between our views. Like I said, the crux is just like how plausible we think it is that things will go out at like a manageable, decentralized defensive base, right? So you seem like significantly more optimistic, but I think we can, it, it feels like it's not crazy to think that one of us over time will update toward the other, right? Mm -hmm. I think so.